Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Minglo Wakniya, today we are going to webinar. We are not going to be able to do the webinar. Today, we are going to be able to do the webinar. We are going to be able to do the webinar. We are going to be able to do the webinar. Ah, mah probably guru probably awal tu zaman tu ni kan lebih yo, jenaruh expert dia ni lebih yo. Jadi ni mah ini ni sekian ni jenaruh COVID nineteen, COVID nineteen ni apa dah dah hai, jenaruh sini ada yang apa sih pak? Ninggal awak ni, jenaruh di ni, jadi sebab di ni, probably guru ni mah, probably dua puluh orang cembal eh, jenaruh sekawan ni ane biro, alam orang cuci bal eh, di ni sekawan ni mah, jenaruh di ni mah probably awak tu zaman tu ni ane biro, di ni asin ni ane biro, jenaruh ni mah ini ni, ah ah sekian ni di COVID nineteen yang cangguh ni ni tu, ni mah probably awak tu zaman tu ni yang cangguh, ah jenaruh sekawan ni 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 tu sebab itu mah, cembal eh, so di alam masa ni mah, jenaruh di probadi guru ni mah probadi awak jangan oh jono aneh ni li ah simbiya jemaah eh jono probadi guru ni ni lor di Asia probadi awak sebab lepas oh jono aneh ni ah mah di Asia ni sih dah macam mana sih ni time bono jono lor di di region ni kan ni biro jono lor ah di kongsi soli long eh sih ni eh biro kongsi project ni ko tim apa juga biro kongsi kongsi sih dah jono lor subi ke lepas lepas orang tak kupi sih bah eh so di ni mah tu yang jenaruh ni mana yang aku jenaruh cemar ni mah cakap cemar apa sebab di ni mah lor jenaruh probadi guru ni mah probadi awak aku jenaruh si probadi tokoh ni tu kubang biro jenaruh di sana tu apa sebab ni ah ah before we start I think I go I want I want like to introduce myself my name is Kang Tu Win I'm the founder and director of si probadi tokoh jenaruh di bawah masa ni jenaruh ah browser ni ni jenaruh aku jenaruh mesti cemar ni jenaruh Kang Tu Win apa sebab ni si si probadi tokoh ni Di tahun dua ni dah dah dia apa sih pak? Jenar siapa baik dok orang lor, ni tahun setiak ni ni video si kuat dia ujar si kuat video jenar ni mah encam ni mah salur ilang ni ni dia jauh ni dia encam encam ni siapa? Wajib dia 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 platform tu kuni ni, group tu kuni ni dia di sini apa sih pak? So before we start anything, I would like to we would like to thanks all the our sponsor. So the jenar di ni boleh mara jenar MBA dua tahun dan tahun ni dia di ka ubang oh Pembo bi de sponsor si bah, itu lo leh jenar adi ni kah mesra bi je mah. Browser ni jenar lo platinum sponsor pi kita cikan ni pawai video pembo tau bah. No official pot de pernah ni ni lo jenar si probadi dua konen tu, si probadi guru adi ni mah probadi awat tu dalam tu ni dua jenar lo pernah ni ni sama tu mah cipah. Official supervisor ni ni video awan ni video jenar lo sama tu mah cipah. Video aso ni di di awat program ni tak kulon dua jenar lo di supervise ni ni di jasin proses di bawah itu pun le Mr Jules kan ni biar kena ni jalan le di web program belum lalu dia sudah awasin dia biar macam apa ya official ah di magazine ah pernah ni ni lah property guru property rebel kan ni biar bawa kunci tawa eh jenar lo di kalau jenar auto ban set tu yang macam belum ni kalau jenar kalau jenar sulit yang gila macam apa ya sulit yang gila lah jenar official penyu pernah ni ni wanya ah di pembu tawa macam apa ya Official charity partner ini adalah Right to Play Thailand. Mesti phone tahu lah, kenapa ni cai? Jono Right to Play ya, jono di 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 kah pun COVID nanti kalah mah, bayi lo sah ni nasi lah, jono di sembuh abis sama si bayi. Official partner dia partner lah, kalau kau communication, official news ah pepan ini adalah Straight Time ya, jono media partner dia ramai mata ini sebenarnya home and tiko magazine ya, tapi buat harap si bayi. Ada juga jenar supporting association ni ni Australia Australia cemar ni mana ni biar bumi pembu bida apa sih pak? Next slide please. And before we start the all the panel, I would like to do the little bit of the housekeeping. If you can has any question, is feel free to type on the chat box in your screen. So jenar di presentation lo ni dia cari mana jenar mega mian sih dia soalnya jenar chat box kan ni biar. Melu ya bah, jenar presentasi, speaker ye, kalau presentasi bidang ini, jenar mekonego, 
เอ่อพี่พี่จ๋าบอกมาဖြစ်ပါတယ်ဆိုဒီနေ့ဒီနေ့စပီကာရေးကိုကျွန်တော်ပြောင်းဆုံးနေနဲ့မိစ်စက်
um, understanding of the problem that helps us support the industry beyond just buildings. So by focusing on quality and integrity, the Myanmar Property Awards hope to inspire property developers to continually raise the bar in terms of design, construction and development. The awards are designed to set a benchmark for investors and to highlight the rising standards across the real estate industry in many countries in this dynamic and resilient region. So thanks again for joining us and thanks again to my fellow speakers for sharing their time and insights today. I look forward to hearing from you. Back to you, Cal. Thank you. Thank you, Julius, for that. Some of the important keybacks. I will do a bit of the summary what you said was well, uh, very important for the, the developer who are going to uh, do the branding and marketing on the international market, which is the only the platform uh, we have on the, uh, at, the, at this stage. So, you know, Mr. Julius Piotr, uh, General, the, the Asia Property Worker, General, should probably do the ကျွန်တော်ပူပေါင်းလိုက်တယ်ပေါ့နော်မနေ့ကကျွန်တော်ရှစ်ပါတွေတခုနဲ့ဒီ <laughs> ကျွန်တော်နိုင်ငံပိုင်းငါးနိုင်ငံမှာကျွန်တော်ဒီဒီဒီဘလော့ဒီပေါ်တန်နေနဲ့ရက်တီတယ်နှစ်ပြီးတ
but also developments that really contribute both to the economy uh, and the, the community. And overall, the development of the real estate industry uh, and our nation here in Myanmar. The awards is open to all developers, whether you're big or small, and, and it's all about making sure that the best developers get recognized, not only locally, but internationally. And more importantly, helping developers improve their sales and marketing pipelines, not only for their current projects, but for their future projects, which is really essential in these times as well. Next slide. <clears throat> So combined, if you look at the reach that Property Guru has across Asia and the reach that Shui Property has within Myanmar, it really is a total end-to-end -end solution, uh, helping developers, big or small, um, promote their projects, both locally and uh, internationally as well. Next slide. <clears throat> And speaking of recognition, it really does promote the best developers, um, judged by an independent uh, group of experts, and promoting your projects um, across the region. And what that means is using the power of Property Guru's digital products and offline products, as well as the vast network that both Property Guru and Shui Property can offer. And I think that's even more important, particularly in Myanmar, as elections are emerging, um, you know, the climate is changing, the economy is still growing during these times, and it's even more important to attract not just local buyers, but foreign buyers, you know, across the region. And that really is the power that uh, both Property Guru and Shui Property can offer uh, to developers uh, through this program. Next slide. And really, when you look at it, even during COVID-19, it's even more important to be supporting the real estate industry, but also the developers to help promote their projects, to increase sales and marketing opportunities, and also their brand and reach across the region, um, which is essentially important, uh, both from a, a developer perspective and also for future projects. So combined, in summary, what it offers is an advanced, uh, very powerful online, offline, and digital marketing products right across the region. And it's all about working together to support developers uh, and the future of property uh, sales for, for our customers. So we're very delighted to be working with Property Guru, and we look forward to an amazing, uh, if not the biggest awards program ever to be held in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Justin, for the, the, the home how this award program is important to the Myanmar developers, uh, even more important than during this COVID-19. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Justin Sweeney, you know, you have to talk about the Shui Property Talkon, you know, the Property Guru, 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 Property when in there, you know, the region of Masuri Big, who know, look at the global address, uh, look at branding or international power so in general, the Ishama, number one Yama, Loni, the property group that found it, so Yamana Yama, uh, number one Yama, Piloni, the ship of white to corner of Puban Bido, it's the global address, Chim Pambo, uh, General Celebi, uh, Piso Dama Pipa, and the Bio, uh, the Blobari Netichi de Boma, uh, two Siko Pomo, Tombula, or teaching, uh, so next as we have uh, Mr. R uh, Richard Imerson uh, from the, the Imerson Real Estate. So I would like to welcome Mr. Richardson, Richard, uh, Richard Imerson. Uh, Richard, over to you. Sure. Uh, next slide, please. So just as a brief introduction, I'm Richard Emerson, Managing Director of Emerson Real Estate. We are a real estate advisory company based in Yangon for the last seven years. Um, it's my pleasure this year to be returning for my fifth year as the chairman of the judging panel for the Property Guru Myanmar Property Awards. And I'm really looking forward this year to working with the fantastic lineup of judges that we have selected um, to oversee the event. So we have a, um, a range of extremely experienced professionals from all aspects of the real estate industry. So 
every uh, detail of the projects that are submitted to us for consideration will be will be looked at and vetted uh, in in significant detail and with the expertise of people who are actively involved in the Myanmar market um, and at the top of their field. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to do this morning briefly is just put some context around the market, um, look at what was happening before the COVID outbreak, and then consider how the market was affected during that period of the lockdown, and then look forward really to see what the future might hold and how also that might affect uh, or relate to foreign investment coming into Myanmar in the real estate industry. So if we look at the beginning of uh, 2020 in Q Q1, before the COVID outbreak, outbreak uh, started in Myanmar, the market actually was looking quite positive at the time. We'd had, after several years of quite challenging market conditions, there were some real positive signs emerging, which we hadn't seen for some time. So in the office sector, the occupancy levels had increased significantly over the, the previous 12 months, uh, due to the fact that rents had come down to more manageable levels. So there was actually a significant increase in take up of office rent of, of office occupancy during that period. Um, at the same time, we saw a take up in the residential sales market improving slowly after a few years of, uh, of difficulties. And it's particularly strong in the budget and mid range projects with some, some of the larger projects selling um, considerable numbers of units during this period. In the retail and service department sectors, there was continuing high occupancy and the maintaining of the rental levels that were that were passing in the market during that period. Um, before the COVID outbreak, the rising tourism numbers, particularly from regional tourists, um, and in particular China, uh, was rising significantly due to strong government promotion projects in, in regional markets. And as a result of this, the, the, the market was able to announce the commencement of several large-scale mixed-use development projects um, major, major regional developers, including uh, Kajima, Amata, um, and Bajaya from Malaysia, announced um, some, some huge projects during the, the first quarter of, of 2020. And an interesting thing to note is that in a, in a market where the um, FDI generally had been slightly under par for the last, last two or three years, in the real estate sector, the FDI coming into the, into the market grew significantly during the period of May to October. Um, and $895 million worth of FDI was announced during that period, which was around 22% of the total FDI coming into Myanmar during that time. And about four times as much as had come into the real estate sector in the previous year. Another positive bright spot was the growing interest in the industrial sector. Um, the main FDI coming into the country uh, sorry, second, second FDI uh, creator was uh, manufacturing, and this was showing strong demand for industrial property in around the Yangon region particularly. Next slide, please. So, in the middle of March, COVID started to take effect on the market. Um, we all know what's happened in the, in the two or three months that have passed since then. There's been significant disruption of markets all around the world. Uh, Myanmar is no, no exception. Uh, I think it's fair to say that most countries will expect wide economic damage, problems with the financial system, unemployment and lowered investment during these times. However, in Myanmar, it seems to have taken um, a much shorter time than maybe in some other countries to, to move forward again. During the shutdown, most offices were closed for six to eight weeks and the majority of companies had their staff home working, as with other countries. Um, interestingly, there was a limited material effect on office landlords during this period, as most of the main office buildings have high occupancy levels from international companies who have signed long leases. And therefore, the office landlords were able to collect their rents as usual. Hotels were much more severely affected. Many were closed as inbound tourism stopped and many foreign expats left the country, leading to severe loss of income in this sector. Retail and F&B businesses also were severely affected. The landlords of retail and F&B properties were particularly um, 
it's affected by significant short-term rental losses as retailers were unable to trade during this period. On the construction side, most of the construction sites, sites in Myanmar were, sh were shut down due to health and safety reasons. Um, there were also material supply chain issues, and this has led to project delays, and there's been a big question mark over employment during this the lockdown period in the construction sector. In the transactional market, sales and leasing transactions have definitely declined during the period, mainly due to the fact that it's been difficult for people to move around and to, and to um, actually transact. Um, and buyers and tenants generally are fairly cautious, uh, which is understandable in the, in the current market. Next slide, please. So moving on to the present day and, and looking forward, um, as I mentioned before, I think it, it's interesting to note that Myanmar has not been so drastically affected by the COVID situation as have a lot of other countries. The number of cases is minimal in comparison, um, especially to Western um, economies. And as a consequence, it's able, it has been able to get back to a normal situation a lot more quickly than others have. Um, the government has reacted strongly to try and move forward to help the economy with a COVID economic recovery plan, which included various measures to try and help the economy overall. Interest rates were lowered to 7%, which is a very positive move to, to stimulate. Um, other measures, including tax deferrals and tax credits, will also help. Uh, the government has been quick to provide loans and fundings for SMEs and critically affected businesses albeit I think there's a limit to how far this actually reaches into the real estate sector. More recently, the IMF has decided to provide a funding package of $356 million to help Myanmar to stimulate the economy. And we hope that some of this will find its way into the, into the construction sector particularly. Positive news is the government has delayed the requirements for banks to meet their capital ad adequacy requirements which means that the banks are able to be more flexible with existing borrowers in terms of loan repayments, giving them some flexibility and, uh, and deferral of those terms. And one of, the, one of the main things that the government has um, in its favour at the current time is it, in putting the Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan in place and creating the project bank, there are um, some ready to move forward uh, large scale infrastructure and real estate projects, which should be a strong driver of growth if uh, the investment can be found to take those forward. Next slide, please. So a brief overview of foreign investment into Myanmar. At the present time, the residential market is essentially a local market as foreigners cannot still legally purchase projects due to the delay in the condo law implementation. At the moment, we understand that the government's condominium management committee is finalizing details regarding the shareholding structures, cost apportionments and unit registrations. But the, there is talk that they are making some good progress with this and hopefully we'll see some further signs that, that this can actually be implemented fully in the near future. At the moment, we know there's foreign buyer demand for, for condominiums, particularly in Yangon, albeit the level of this demand is unquantified. One of the key issues that come, comes up when we're talking to foreign investors is that there should be suitable financing in place for those foreign investors to be able to acquire units in the Myanmar real estate market. And at the moment, there is a question mark over this. Currently, some foreigners who have been keen to enter the market have been illegally acquiring units under nominee arrangements with a local Myanmar partner. And in other cases, they have entered into convertible contracts with developers so that the contract will convert to a legal, a legal contract as soon as the condominium law is ratified. Looking at foreign developers generally, particularly in terms of them coming into the country um, in order to undertake development, it's quite possible that the foreign investors will have a lower risk appetite in the current market due to the general uncertain, um, uncertainty that prevails. But I think a lot of them recognize the positive future potential of Myanmar. Um, from our experience of dealing with foreign investors from around the world, many of them are interested in developing residential condominium projects in, the, in Myanmar, Yangon particularly, but many are waiting to see at the moment to, uh, to get a, a clearer idea of the uh, improvements in the market, which will incur a stronger sales take up. Next slide, please. 
So it's looking forward to the future. I think there's a lot of positivity around for Myanmar in comparison to other markets. ADB revised its four part forecast for GDP growth to 1.8% during 2020 and rising to 6% in 2021. This is the second highest growth rate in the region behind Vietnam and it outperforms the rest of the Southeast Asia average, which currently is showing a growth of minus 2.7%. This makes Myanmar an interesting investment market for the future. And I'm sure that those um, investors who are in other regions will be taking note of this and thinking if they want to invest into a, into a functioning and forward looking market, then Myanmar should be one of their, one of their key targets. We hope that the government will recognize that the real estate industry is a major driver of economic growth. It should be part of their recovery plan. In other countries in the world, it normally when there is a catastrophe in the market, such as COVID, one of the first things that governments will do is look to create infrastructure and real estate projects in order that the construction sector will be, will be um, livened in order to, uh, to create um, investment. In the local market, one of the key takeaways is that the interest rates lowered to 7% has actually stimulated a lot of demand in the market recently. It's amazing in the last four to six weeks how much interest there has been from local Myanmar buyers looking to acquire property on the back of the fact that interest rates are now significantly lower than they were before. And therefore, their bank financing will be cheaper. As I mentioned before, we hope that there will be a finalisation of the condominium law and the apartment law, hopefully during 2020. Um, both of these things have been long outstanding um, and talked about for a number of years and it really is critical to the real estate market that these are now finalised um, in order that everyone can move forward. In general terms, the market remains underdeveloped in comparison to other markets and there are endless opportunities for quality development in all sectors. The government, however, must work hard to create new occupational demand to meet the future supply, particularly in the commercial sectors. There are a good number of projects in the pipeline at the moment and the government must identify um, ways of stimulating the economy, particularly uh, in terms of foreign direct investment to bring more and more occupiers into the market. I think one thing that is definitely uh, very clear in Myanmar is the huge demand for modern affordable housing that exists. This really hasn't been tapped into yet and, and there are massive opportunities for international developers and local developers to create products at the right price point in order to satisfy the market demand. And lastly, we think that in a, in a market where the financing, um, financing of property projects might be slightly more complicated for the next year or two, given the COVID uh, situation and the banking risk, uh, risk appetite being reduced, we expect that there will be a need for local developers to engage with foreign developers and investors and to look at creating joint venture opportunities. And therefore, there will be a, a huge need, particularly in the residential markets, for exposure to international markets. And this is one of the big benefits that you will get from entering the Myanmar Property Awards. Thank you, Gong, and back to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard, for the, the, the real insight uh, of the uh, the, uh, the, the, the market before COVID, uh, during COVID, and then was the future will look like on the maybe on the COVID. So I, I, I will go to, I will do the very short uh, translation of the audience that what, what, what you actually means. So I, I may, uh, um, uh, you Richard, know, Mr. Richard, uh, Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard, COVID Richard, Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard, COVID ကမပြန်ပြီးကပါတီဖြစ်မဲ့ခြင်းရဲ့ကျွန်တော်တို့ဒီကိုဗစ်အလွန်အာကျွန်တော်မြင်မအိတ်ချက်မီဆွေးခ
ကျွန်တော်တို့ကိုပဲထိခိုက်ခဲ့အတွေ့ရတယ်ကျွန်တော်တို့ရှော်ပင်းမောတွေကျွန်တော်တို့ပလာစာတွေပိတ်တက်အ
So next apps, I would like to invite Mr. Joe E. Chung from the BDO. So uh, Mr. Joe, over to you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Kokang. Um, Mingalaba, and good afternoon to all distinguished guests and members of the media. Hi, I'm Joe from BDO Nyema. Um, BDO is the official supervisor of the Asia Property Award covering 17 countries, including Nyema. Um, next slide, please. And next slide. Uh, also next slide. Okay, so um, we, we, we basically leverage upon our experience, monitoring context and award system around the world. BDO is entrusted with overseeing the entire judging process. Uh, work with the organizer of the property award for more than 10 years to ensure that the judging is conducted fairly and with integrity. Next slide, please. Um, the awards um, have an unparalleled reputation for being credible, fair and transparent. Nominees of competitive awards are evaluated based on strict general criteria set by the independent judging panel. Both organizer and video have standard operating procedures in place to govern the whole judging process. And I took the liberty of including this simplified judging process in the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see, um, first we have the first judges meetings. Um, this is where the independent judging pan, uh, panel is formed and chaired by the chairman. For, for our case, Mr. Richard Emerson is our chairman and they deliberate on eligible nominees based on the agreed eligibility criteria. Um, for example, uh, for the criteria for residential developments, it must be completed in the period between January 2020 and before December 2023 and must have a construction permit. And these criteria are not set in stone, but varies from country to country. So every time subsequent to all this, um, every judge meeting, the organizer will circulate minutes of meeting to reconfirm all parties' understanding and agreements. And before kicking off the site visit, uh, there's a very important procedure here, which is the declarations of conflict of interest uh, a check. So um, prescribed disclosure form will be provided to all judges for declarations. If there's any potential conflict of interest on certain entrance, the relevant judges shall be disqualified or recursed from voting or scoring on entries which they have a conflict of interest. All these circumstances that may create a trait to independent are listed on the disclosure form and serve as a guidance to all the judges. For example, um, uh, the circumstances like having an immediate family members or close family members who is a director, office officer, and an employee of entrance. Then we move to the site visit. Um, in site visit, we have a so-called site inspection guidelines for judges uh, uh, to follow and will be shared or uh, circulated out to judges. Um, in the guideline, there are in total 14 guidelines for the judges to follow. Um, things like um, uh, developers are requested not to give the judges any gift and have to politely decline any that are offered. And we also do not give the developer any feedback on the inspections or the likelihood of winning during the receipt. Again, um, all these procedures is to ensure a fair, transparent and credible judging system. During the, the, the site receipt, um, score sheet will be circulated um, to all judges and then collected by video for declarations and presentation at the final judges meeting. And all the, the, the prescribed agree criteria are set in the score sheet. So the judges uh, have to consider carefully on all these criteria. For example, for developer awards, we have criteria like uh, company reputations, image, corporate social responsibility initiative, and etc. For development and design award, um, we have criteria like locations, ready for money, um, a stage of completion, site layout, and etc. So um, at the final judges meeting in the presence of video representative, um, the center panel agree upon the final shortlist, uh, which comprises one winner and up to four highly commented. And video um, is there to verify all winners and highly commented results from the judges and present the result to the organizers. And then finally, the organizer will publicly announce the shortlist one month before the gala night. 
And of course, um, last but not least, is the award night. Um, uh, we just dress in the best we can and arrive, arrive early to enjoy the drinks and networking. Um, but our role as BDO, as a supervisor, does not stop here. We have to ensure the winners are actually announced correctly. Next slide, please. Oh, that's, that's all for my presentations. Um, thank you very much. I give back the floor to Kokao. Yeah. And thank you, Mr. Joe, uh, for the how uh, BDO is uh, the supervising this, our programs uh, through the few stages. Uh, and we, uh, we do the short, very short uh, uh, translation on the, what you mentioned on the stages. Um, uh, I think can go back to the, 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 the process page. So firstly, uh, that we turn uh, browse on in the uh, the video in the no? the map about judging panel meeting no by judging meeting my general the the chip on sound general you chip up to buy it in it in mba 2020 uh chip on center mr mr richard in my same chip by mr richard in my any chip as in a sound bill the video general side visit my dog game on general the judging independent the judgment in my body no uh Test and if your conflict of interest uh PR general through the when project in a conflict of interest pin is so in the big screen looking or the if your paper down my paper. So general's uh side busy be the general uh a bid you only near the side busy goal, the schooling she go can be your side busy my layout uh some your bid on my paper. No also no final just medium PD the uh the cinema the the shortlist the 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 Mr. Jules can be your Simbia Absibai. So, uh, next steps, I, uh, I, like, uh, I would like to uh, invite Mrs. Uh, Phong Tom from the uh, country title from Right to Bleed Thailand. So, Mrs. Uh, uh, actually, Right to Bleed Thailand is the official charity partner of the, this MBA 2020. Uh, Mr. Phong Tom, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kong, for your introduction. And hi, everybody. I'm really honored to be part of this webinar. And um, of course, it's an honor for Right to Play to be the official uh, charity partner. I'm Punyanut Patanotai. My name is Long. So mostly people call me Om uh, for short. And I'm a country director of Right to Play Thailand. And I, uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Okay. And today, oh no, can you go back one more? The first one. Yes. And um, today I would like to uh, take everybody um, into the journey with me of how we usually play. And um, also to how do we use play to respond to the COVID-19 uh, situation, especially um, when we are working with the migrants uh, community in, in Thailand that are the construction workers. Next, please. Yes, so for right to place uh, globally, next. Yes, uh, for us, we are working, we have a programs in 14 countries around the world. Um, we are working in Africa, Asia, Middle East, uh, and Canada's uh, indigenous communities. And each year we reach 2.35 million children. And we're also working in the 52 uh, refugee camps, including the nine camps uh, along the border of the uh, Thai and Myanmar as well. And not just children, we're also working with the teacher and coaches. And also we try to maintain the uh, gender equality aspect that 40%, 47% are girls. Next, please. And how do we use play to uh, make change and how it change happen? Well, the, we use what is called play-based learning in everything we do. And we use the four type of play, which are games, uh, sport, creative play, which are, um, can be music, art, or uh, play. Um, and also free play that whenever children 
place, they're already learning. And these are both our inside and outside the classroom. Next, please. And um, how can play save life? Uh, we use our unique uh, play-based methodology to keep children in school and out of the uh, worst form of child labor. We teach them um, how to prevent life-threatening diseases, especially uh, with the COVID-19 situation these days, it's really important. And um, we, we build their confidence to challenge harmful traditions and keep themselves safe from any exploitation and abuse, and also empower uh, them to choose the peaceful collaborations to over instead of violence and confrontation. Next, please. And for us, uh, for the office of Thailand as a country overview. Next. For us, uh, Thailand, we operate in 20 locations across Thailand um, in the temporary shelter along the borders, Thai and Myanmar. We're working with the uh, schools context. We're working with the juvenile center for the youth that committed uh, crime. And uh, we work with the migrants communities and also uh, urban community, which is a slum in, in various areas in Bangkok as well. And not just Thailand, uh, we also have some programs in, in Myanmar. And in 2017, the Thailand team has started working across the boundaries um, in Myanmar uh, through the Mesot, a little bit up north of Thailand uh, office. And um, in 2019, we are working with the ASEAN Secretariat and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Norway to have this project called the ASEAN Youth Sport and Development and Peace and Leadership Project, which we already started uh, six projects in Myanmar as well. And um, in Southeast Asia, because we are the partner of the ASEAN uh, Secretariat, so now we have uh, been building the youth leaders in the 10 countries to use play and sport to be a tools uh, for the development um, in the 10 countries in Southeast Asia. Next, please. And this is our uh, project in Myanmar through the ASEAN Secretariat. We have been working in Mandalay, in uh, Nepidor, in Iravadi, in Yangkung, and Loko. And these are, we are working through the community, uh, which is the youth leaders, to deliver or uh, develop a life skill through the uh, sport, um, to promote a sense of ASEAN community, promote healthy lifestyle, and increasing um, the crime prevention through sport and development. And um, uh, within one year, we already deliver, uh, you know, our activity involving Myanmar children um, around almost 600 children. Next, please. And how, how do we, how it can play a safe life, you know, because in a crisis, we protect children uh, through a power of play. And um, how are we using play to respond to the COVID-19? Next. Okay, so during the COVID-19 crisis, we found that the they, which is the parents of the children um, that are working in the migrant communities are the, the last to know or have access to information and they're usually the first to go as in out of job. Um, there are also many of the uh, Myanmar migrants are also trapped in Thailand because of the border close. And in Thailand, we have uh, estimated approximately about almost 4 million migrant workers from uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. And among that, around 2.8 million are uh, documented workers, which means the rest are non-documented or illegal. And nationals from Myanmar mark up of the largest uh, group migrant workers population in Thailand. And of course, they are working in, in various industries, but construction are still the biggest industry that they are working with, uh, following tourism, domestic workers, and fisheries industry. Next, please. And um, uh, we have the team to do research and then we found that the migrants community are, they are usually with the minimum knowledge of how to protect themselves when the COVID-19 happened. Um, their lack of access to a proper hygiene because of the face mask and the, the sanitary hand gel are really expensive. 
uh, many lost their jobs and income as well as uh, their residents due to the closing of businesses and especially in the tourism and construction related uh, industry. Many of them are, have the increasing debt and, and become the subject of exploitation. And the most affected services since the COVID-19 outbreak are to their livelihood, uh, water, the lack of water, electricity, transportation. And also we found that um, in order to survive during the COVID-19, each family, they have to cut down their uh, food consum consumption. Like instead of have three meals, they cut to one meal to survive each day uh, during this time. And for children that uh, we are working with, the main challenges since the outbreak of COVID-19 are the limit, uh, limited or no access to education, insufficient food intake, no social interaction with friends, and also stress uh, from the family issues and uncertainties. Next, please. Yeah, so we are working with migrant children and parents uh, working in Thailand, um, including the special needs uh, children with disability in the migrants committee in Thailand as well in um, Mesot or Ta province in the northern part of Thailand and also the Dao South. We're working in Phuket, southern part of Thailand. And for migrant communities with immediate needs, um, we together with our network, once we found out, we have been distributed uh, more than thousand of crisis relief bag, food, livelihood supplies, uh, provided hygiene packs, face marks, and set up a temporary hand watching station because we found that in most of the construction site that they are leaving the lack of uh, water. Um, so to, to make themselves watching their hands properly, it's really difficult. So we set up some kind of temporary hand watching station. Um, we have been raised awareness about COVID-19 and how to protect themselves and also monitoring the situation in the communities closely, especially try to avoid all form of uh, exploitation of children during the crisis. Next, please. And because of the uh, school, once all the stay at home orders uh, roll out, we shift to uh, our, all our program to remote, um, remote, doing remotely. And also because of the learning, migrants learning center across, the school across. So we have to find a way of how to reach children remotely. So we develop uh, life skill educational games. And uh, first of all, we connect with them through all, all type of social media. We have uh, reaching out through our youth leader, teacher, using like that Facebook group. And Right to Play also have this uh, called Play at Home games package that we are delivered to the migrant uh, boarding house to the children at home. So they have some kind of like uh, games to be physical fit, mentally fit, and also some kind of games that they can play with the family to create uh, generate awareness and we uh, translate all that package into uh, Burmese, in Karen and all the necessary uh, language that the migrants can have access. And once the lockdown release, our staff visited children at home and continue playing with them one-on-one uh, -on -one and working with the communities and partner to uh, prepare the school for the new normal practices because the in Thailand the school now open and the migrants are learning center are also doing the same line with that so we have to make sure that they are practice all the new normal step and ensure the safety of the children of migrants uh, community next please and yes uh, any support um, you know make a difference so uh, all this time, Right to Play is really grateful for all the support. And we also looking for more support because those support can help us uh, keep children safe and healthy. It can help uh, us doing our work to keep children learning and keep children mentally strong. So if any of uh, the company or any of you are interested to be partner with us working um, either for the migrants, construction migrants, uh, workers, Myanmar workers in Thailand or any project in Myanmar doing CSR with youth and uh, using sport to do the development in the community. We are really happy uh, to work with you as well. Next, please. 
Yes, so I think that that's it for us, for Right to Play, and then thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Pundam from the Right to Play uh, Thailand. I think it's very uh, amazing things you, you guys are doing, especially on the border uh, sites, uh, helping on the other migrant worker who are especially working most heavily on the construction sector. And they are, uh, is uh, we, we, we uh, and for the MP, we are very grateful to have you on the boat. Also, and then everyone who want to support the right to play Thailand and then uh, go to the uh, social media page and the websites and uh, the contribute, contribute the, uh, the movement for the, especially they need a lot of support during the COVID-19. Uh, yeah. So I thank you, thank you, uh, and thank you everyone for this uh, other speaker. So I did to know the need. Pure that I speak alone, you know, Jesus Tema, you know, the need. Pure that I tell you, you know, the you know, in terms of secret, you know, your COVID nineteen, you know, people are me, the future outlook, the how you see the future, the not only the future, but also the future, you know, the future, you know, the future, you know. So now, good quarter, you know, so now season the community is talking about, you know, the question and answer kind of about it. So question is, we we have a lot of questions actually from our audience that we we need to answer. But based on the times and the, I will do the, I will put the question to the specific relevant speaker. So I think first question, I think, uh, go to the uh, Miss uh, Richard. Mm, so I think the question is, uh, where's the market situation of Myanmar real estate sector on board rent and batches amid COVID-19? Where's the market situation? Well, I think as I as I mentioned in the slides and the presentation, during the during COVID-19, during the the middle period where everything was locked down, then everything was. Uh, there was little going on in terms of transactions on the rent rental side or the sale side. Um, I think, as I said before, that the market was relatively stable actually before COVID struck, and I and I'm a believer now because of the the way that Myanmar has handled the the outbreak that probably the the bounce back will be relatively quick. Um, and there's no real reason, as long as everything continues to be managed properly, that the market shouldn't return to the situation it was in pre-COVID fairly quickly. I think, you know, in, in the last three or four weeks, we've already seen that Myanmar is, is kind of getting back to normal again. Um, it just remains for people to get the confidence to start looking at their future business plans on the commercial side. Um, I think when a lot of the foreign expats come back to the country as well, it will return the uh, sort of service department and office sectors back to normal relatively quickly. Um, I think that probably one of the big the, the big things to take away from this is the fact that Myanmar should come back stronger from this. It will it will clear out a lot of um, of issues that possibly existed in the market before. It gives a chance for the, the government and the market to reset itself and, and move forward um, stronger and better. So I, yeah, my personal view is I think the market will be okay. I think it will be stable. I mean, clearly that there is still going to be a massive economic distress in the country generally, and I think that's the same as any other country around the world. But in terms of the fundamentals um, and the market, I, I think there's a reasonable demand for for space, and the market is relatively in balance. So yeah, look forward to that moving forward again. Yes, uh, I did, I agree with you there. Uh, you, you answer it because uh, compared to the other country, we can we we cover very quickly if we really properly manage the the situations. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, next question. I think I, I want to. I also would like to you answer also regarding the industry real estate uh, sector. So where's the outlook for the industry real estate sector in Myanmar, especially with the increase of uh, as you said, across the country. Sorry, with the increase of. Come, sorry, can you just repeat the question, please? Sorry. The industry of real estate. Where's the outlaws? Outlaw will be the industry of real estate because of the 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 uh, the industry so the city law uh, industry 
uh, they're, they're back. Okay. Um, yeah. I think what we've seen in the last, the last 12 or 18 months in, in Myanmar is that there has been an increase in demand for industrial property. There's been a significant number of new foreign companies coming in and setting up plants for manufacturing. Um, a lot of that's gone into the garment sector, um, but there's also quite a lot of money that's gone into food, uh, food and beverage production as well, uh, construction material production. Um, Tillowa has been the, the shining example of this and it's attracted most of the foreign investment because of the, the ease of setting up a business there and the, the fact that it's, um, everything is transparent and well managed um, and the approval process is, is easy to go through. Um, obviously in, in the last three or four months there's been a bit of a shock to the system in terms of uh, there's been issues particularly in the garment industry um, relating to overseas demand for those products that were being manufactured and I think that will take some time to come back um, and I hope that there's some way that the the, the employment can be maintained um, and, and brought back to work relatively quickly in those sectors but you know the rest of the world is suffering and I think a lot of the developed economies are suffering considerably more than perhaps the emerging economies like Myanmar and the demand for those products will take some time to come back again. Um, but the other thing to look at is that there, on the back of the rising demand, there are quite a few new industrial zones which are being promoted um, and will be, you know, start to be constructed in the next one or two years. Um, the demand certainly is there to take up that space. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities to create new industrial products uh, in the real estate sector to meet the market. Um, the one big question mark that we always have in Myanmar, of course, is power. And if the government can move, move quickly to solve the power issue, and enable some of those projects to move forward, then that will have an enormous impact on the demand in the industrial sector. So as soon as power is resolved and there is adequate power for the new zones, then there will be an influx of international money coming in to set up manufacturing businesses. Because um, at the moment, I think you know, there's a lot of demand for industrial uh, companies coming out of China because of the America-US, uh, sorry, the US-China uh, trade situation. And a lot of that money is currently going into Vietnam and Indonesia. And it would be nice to think that if Myanmar can get, get power sorted out quickly, that we could capture some of that interest because I'm sure Myanmar would be on the radar of those investors. It, it's just a little too early at the moment because the infrastructure is not, not quite good enough in comparison to other regional markets. Yeah, thank you. I hope, I hope uh, this, thanks for the answer. I, don't, I hope uh, this answer will satisfy some of the questions. So, so I would like to move to the another question. Another question is we get with the uh, the 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 property this property or what what does it mean to the local developer? I think Julius already mentioned what does it mean on the first on the on his presentation. I think where we create Julius, you can answer what really does it mean to the Myanmar developers uh, for this program. Well, the property wars, I, I mean, I think we, we kind of, as we mentioned, there's, there's multiple benefits here for developers. Um, it, not only is it a recognition of the quality of their projects and their commitment to improving the standards of real estate in Myanmar, it also gives them the opportunities to celebrate their hard work and also to market you know, that quality in Myanmar and internationally. Because when you win an award like this and are given the recognition of an expert panel of judges and also uh, an expert panel of judges with international experience, that is a stamp of quality. And that is something that will obviously give you a benefit for your own recognition and your own prestige, but also something you can share with potential buyers and investors and joint venture partners to say, look, we have been recognized on an international level as among the best in Myanmar. So property awards have many different benefits to Myanmar developers, and I'm sure you know, they use those uh, advantages in the best way possible to drive their business forward, to attract new buyers, and also obviously to, to give themselves more exposure across Asia as we emerge from the, the COVID crisis. So that's what I would say the value of the awards is. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think uh, Julius already mentioned on the first slide also the, the, how the, the uh, we also answer a lot of uh, uh, this question to the other, 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 other blah, blah, blah. Even though uh, we 
as Richard mentioned, foreigner cannot legally buy the property. That is great time to do the branding at the moment we because if you want to uh, uh, market on the overseas foreign country, it's great to do, do the marketing and a great, uh, great way to recognize their effort and the, uh, the quality of the projects. Um, and then another question I wanted to uh, just then to answer you. So the question is, what is the new nomad or industry? What's the new nomad or industry? So uh, Justin, can you please answer the question? And then Justin, you are on the mute, sorry. When you say the new normal, are you referring to uh, the way industry. we're working? Yeah, industry. Oh, well, I think that, you know, it's going to be a new normal for quite some time, right? So um, <clears throat> if we look at the global landscape and what certainly what's happening in Myanmar, um, you know, many people are working from home. Um, you know, in the Myanmar market, you know, we have plenty of buyers still, which is quite surprising um, that they're still there. But I think the new normal is that all developers and anybody working in the industry um, have to be more innovative. And that means you've got to be online. If you're not online um, or you're not digital, then it will be uh, almost impossible to sell property. <clears throat> and and a particularly, you know, in this climate, what we found is um, our online expos have been extremely successful. And that's because, because of the reach of, I guess, the internet and the reach of being digital. Um, you know, we ran an expo and in fact, we're going to be running one every month <clears throat> because it's been extremely successful. So the banks have been supportive. Developers are very, uh, very interested and very involved. Um, and as a result, um, the new normal is that everyone has to be online. Everyone has to be digital. It doesn't mean that you don't stop meeting buyers. I think that's still, there's still that um, human touch, so to speak, <clears throat> without touching. But definitely, if you want to reach you know, your buyers, particularly in Myanmar, then you've got to be online and, and, and you've got to be digital and you've got to move past the way the buyers are, uh, are operating. And the way they're operating, everybody is online. I think with the, the Reach Property Guru and Shrey Property, the buyers in Myanmar are a lot more sophisticated. They're a lot more online, that's for sure. And they're looking for property, which is not only a great deal, but they're looking for an award-winning property of a high standard. Um, and really this is what, uh, you know, the, that, you know, combined is the, is the new normal in, in Myanmar, for sure. Thank you, thank you. I think mean, next question, I, 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 I would like to request to Mrs. Fontan to answer it. That question is actually really related to what actually you, you're doing at the moment on the, from the right to play uh, Thailand. What can the real estate industry can improve of the living condition or construction worker and families? Yes, um, thank you for the question. And I think what can the real estate industry do to help improve? There are actually many things, but I would like to emphasize maybe to remember the big A, which is access. Um, for construction, uh, living condition of construction and contract workers, they need access to have a decent living condition, first of all, for the basic living needs, you know, place to sleep, uh, eat and clean, water and toilet are one of the most important things as well. So to have access to that is really important and to have access to health and safety, especially during the COVID-19 or post-COVID-19, not just uh, physically, but mentally, where can they have information, where can they go for, uh, you know, healthcare support, anything, if they need help to have access to that. And lastly, is the what right to play has been advocated for, uh, or this time is for to have access to the safe space, especially for children in the construction site, um, to have a safe split space for them to play and learn while they are waiting for their parents or construction workers are working in the uh, to complete the project we found out that many times you know many little children because they have to be around so they are playing with the sharp object rusty nails or um electricity cords which are 
uh, dangerous and also many are left behind on the street and are being exploited or dangerous um, in many areas. So um, to have a proper space for them to play and learn are crucial. And I uh, would like to urge all the real estate sectors leaders to, um, to consider or have some kind of like uh, support uh, for that to improve the basic uh, well-being of the vulnerable children in the construction site. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the answers. So uh, next question is, I think I, I also would like to request uh, Richard to answer it. as really opportunity for the developer. What the COVID-19 bring to the local developer? What's the opportunity for them to uh, moving forward? Uh, Richard, can you please answer it? Certainly. I, I think in, within Myanmar generally, the big opportunity for any developer is to be involved in um, the affordable housing sector. It's clearly where the majority of the demand is. And um, the, the opportunity is to be innovative and to create new concepts which can be developed and sold into the market at the right price point to meet the demand that, is, that exists out there. Um, I know there's, there's a lot of developers that I've, I've been working with in Myanmar who have been spending considerable amounts of time behind the scenes looking at the, um, the design aspects of housing in order to build efficient projects which can be developed more cheaply in order to, to reduce the sales price and make it more, um, more relevant to the people that are actually looking to buy these projects. Um, and I think the other thing to bear in mind is that there's a, there's, the opportunity in development is to, to look very, very carefully at design and to come up with schemes that not only provide units for people, but also create communities and to, and to create places where people want to live and want to, want to be based. Um, and at the moment in Myanmar, everything is slightly complicated because of the, the costs that are involved and the, and the kind of the financial aspects of those developments. So there's a lot to be done in terms of improving design and quality of, of products. It doesn't mean that the, it needs to be more expensive, it just needs to be better thought out um, and with better provisions of the things that people actually need from a living perspective. Yeah, I think that the that, that question is, is and it's not because of pandemics, uh, the question is uh, what the uh, re people really need. And then uh, Richard also mentioned the in slide that affordable housing is there. Uh, price spike for the developer, not only local, also international developer, because the affordable housing really need in the market, but not the affordable means not only on the price, also like the, the quality of the projects. So uh, thanks for the answer. Uh, and then uh, ne uh, next question, we had a few questions and uh, here also, and then most of the questions are related to the, the whole market. And then uh, Richard is uh, playing the very big role in here. So I, I also would like to uh, request another question uh, for the, uh, actually foreigner, because most of the foreigner, uh, because of COVID-19, they cannot even to return to Myanmar. So because of the, the price, price, what, what would the key factor where, where the, the price on a renter or say, uh, because of the lockdown? Well, I, I think clearly this is difficult because a, a lot of residential projects that have been sold have been sold to investors who are looking to, to rent to, to foreign expats. Um, and it, it's quite clear that a lot of foreign expats have, have left Myanmar for the time being um, of all nationalities. So I, I know a lot of people from the UK and Europe that have left, um, but also a lot of Japanese and, and Koreans and, and other friends that we have. It, it, it's difficult from, from the residential perspective. And I think at the moment, landlords have to be a little bit flexible. It, it's actually no different on the commercial side in, in some other places as well. But I think at the moment, if you can find, find somebody to, to pay something or a, lo a lower rent in order to get you through this time, then it's best to accept that. Uh, it's a, you know, everybody has to share the responsibility of this, of this crisis and the landlords have to give a bit as well as the tenants have to give a bit too. So I think that's the general, the general way that things should be looked at. Um, clearly, there will become a time shortly when people will return back to Myanmar. And I think then there will be, there will be new demand and there will, be, there will be tenants who come into the market and who want to take new leases on, on residential and commercial properties. So um, I think that's, that's imminent in the next month or, month or two. 
So hopefully the landlords won't have too long to wait. And there'll be sufficient demand then that it will start to uh, to put the rental levels back up to where they where they were pre-COVID. Yeah. Thank you. Thank could you I much. just add, Calm, could I just yeah. add a little, um, just from an international perspective, yeah. like Property Guru does a, uh, a regular consumer sentiment survey across all our markets. So we're looking at Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. And in terms of COVID and what it's actually creating is a very strong ap appetite for people to buy property in many of these countries. Because in Malaysia, for example, young people are saying that the experience of being locked at home, uh, being stuck with close proximity to family, they, they, they want to break out and they want to buy their own place. So this is also uh, something that you know addresses affordability, a young generation of people looking to buy property. In Singapore, what it's done, uh, the response to the survey is drive more interest in international property. So some 40% of people interviewed in Singapore said they were looking for international property in the next couple of years. And then in Thailand, again, it's pushing people towards owning a family home. 75% of people in this consumer survey said they wanted to buy a property in the next two years. So COVID-19, in terms of an opportunity, is making people think about their future from a property ownership perspective, which I think is very encouraging and may also be relevant to, to Myanmar. Yes, and, and actually it's uh, true because some of the developers also in Myanmar, uh, they, they, they had a lot of inquiry because of the lockdown, because the home is more important, really yeah, important yeah. right now, because not only uh, this, uh, they stay because they have to work from home. So they had the different environment. So uh, that's why most, I think we also met a lot of de de local developer here. They're also trying to update the, the products. Uh, they not only keep the where to stay, but also work from home. So there's a, there's a, the things that uh, COVID-19 brought to the market. <laughs> Jack, um, we did a, uh, our other business, JobNet, did a survey of work from home and, um, you know, I think 50, 60 percent of most corporates are back in the office and the people that were working from home, they want to get back in the office. They missed, you know, meeting their staff and, you know, their fellow colleagues and getting out there for the social interaction. But the other part was there were too many at home so um, people don't want to live with their mum and dad anymore they what they want to move out uh, so definitely a, a rise and that's why we've seen a, a spike in sales surprisingly during this time particularly in the affordable market for sure yeah yeah great uh, I think uh, great that there's a time for what we have for the QA session uh, we hope uh, we answered your question uh, very well so next mode on uh, so uh, next days, I would like to thank all the speaker uh, today, uh, the all the speaker. I also I would like to uh, uh, hear from the uh, our speaker uh, for the their pairing words for the this today live one. And I want to I would like to start with the Julius K. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, just thank you to everyone for joining us today. Very insightful, and so, you know, from Richard particularly, the insights on on the uh, on the Myanmar market and pre, post and during COVID, very, very useful, I think, for everybody that was watching today. And Justin, thank you as well for, you know, for partnering with us this year and for driving this, uh, this new look property awards with, with our combined efforts. That's really good. Uh, Joe from BDO, always a pleasure. He's, uh, you know, BDO have been a long term supporter of ours and adds to the credibility of the awards, particularly. And um, yeah, Kunam for giving us great insights into the you know, how we can help through the real estate industry, especially in such an area that's so relevant to, uh, to property in terms of the, the, the migrant workers. So I think it's been really useful for, you know, for everybody and Kaung for being an excellent, uh, excellent host as well. So, but from my perspective, just a quick <laughs> reminder, can we just go to the next slide to have a quick look at the date? Is of the, uh, yeah, so the, the Gala Dinner Awards ceremony is set for Friday, 23rd of October. Um, at the Sule Shangri-La Hotel in Yangon. And then the winners who uh, are named on that evening in Myanmar then have a, uh, well, apart from enjoying fantastic networking opportunities, I would like to point out that this year, obviously there will be uh, COVID-19 considerations. So there will be temperature checks, et cetera, you know, and um, probably mask wearing and social distancing applied to the galas because that will be standard procedure for the hotel as well as for ourselves. But it doesn't mean we will not be able to celebrate um, in equal measure. 
And then the winners from the Myanmar, the Myanmar Property Awards will also have the opportunity to go on to the regional final uh, in the next slide, which is the 15th Property Guru Asia Grand Final on the 4th of December held in Bangkok at the Athene Hotel. So these are just some dates for your diary. Uh, prior to that, we will buckle down to the judging process with our able chairman, Mr. Richard Emerson, to lead the panel of expert judges and choose the best properties in Myanmar. So that's 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 what I'd like to wrap up with. Thank you, Cal. Thank you, thank you, Gilles. So, uh, so Justin, uh, I also would like to hear from the bearing work from you also. Oh, I, uh, look, uh, thank you, uh, Kang, and thank you, Jules. And, um, you know, it's an immense pleasure to be partnering with Property Guru. Um, you know, Richard, it's great to be working with you again. You're an amazing judge and you bring a lot of credibility to the awards. So we're very, very pleased and, and happy to be working with you. Um, and also video, you know, to have Joe on board, which is great. And, and what a great cause, um, you know, with Right to Play. So we're very honoured to be uh as part of the, the the partnership and we're looking forward to you know a fantastic uh awards not only for Myanmar but for asia so thank you very very much as well yeah thank you thank you uh so i wanted to richard i wanted to uh hear it from you also the betting world was a summary of the near future you can give me the short speech okay thank you Colin. um yeah, just a brief a brief word to say thank you very much to the organisers today. It's been a great event and a, and a good opportunity to see a, a rounded overview of the real estate industry as it is at, in 2020 in Myanmar. Um, we hope everyone's enjoyed the, the information that's been provided. And to the developers who are listening, uh, we look forward to receiving your entries in due course so we can, uh, can look forward to our judging process. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jules, I would like to thank you for the few parting words from you also. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this um, this this webinar, and also thank you for giving an opportunity to video to be the supervisor, official supervisor for this uh, property award. And personally, I'm very honored to be supervising the Property Guru Nyama Award for the past uh, three years since 2018 on behalf of video. Um, the Nyama Property Award in partnership with uh, Sui Property this year are, are regarded among the region's finest real estate developers as the most respected, fair and transparent award that celebrate the best achievers in Nyama growing market. Um, if you want me to use one word to describe the whole award programs and also why um, ASEA Property Awards uh, has been so successful, the one word will be credibility. Um, so thank you, thank you so much. Um, I look forward to seeing uh, who emerges as this year winners. Thank you so much. Have a nice yeah, day. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Joe, for the your speech and the work. Also, also, I would like to request uh, Mr. Fontan from the Right to Play. I think uh, who are, uh, it's really uh, great to see what you talk, what you guys are doing on the on the, on the for the case uh, even during the pandemic. Can 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 I have you a few words from also? Yes, um, thank you, Kang, and thank you, the organizers as well. As I said, this is really honored uh, for myself and also for Right to Play it, the, to be the uh, official charity partner. And, and it's really uh, moving to see that the real estate uh, industry also put emphasis on the importance of uh, the other side, you know, which is the human well-being, the, the livelihood of the others, and what we call sometimes, you know, many people behind the scene of the uh, uh, construction of every success of the project, we usually say they are the invisible voices, especially children or many people behind the scene that they don't have much of the voices. And um, I think this is a great opportunity that everyone can uh, check and also represent and have this responsibility, uh, you know, for for the well-being of everyone and put put that forward. And I'm really happy to be part of this uh, award. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone for the, the, the for your time today. So before uh, we like to, I would like to thank our sponsor also. Again, like, uh, 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 so to, for the, our sponsor, like for the, this MB2 Dundon, there's a, uh, we had a sponsor and a partner who are going to, uh, for their great support, uh, platinum sponsor, Hitachi, uh, official board of the partner, you know, property, 
uh, official supervisor and PDO general, the uh, uh, official uh, property web magazine in a property group, uh, property web magazine. No, Sulish uh, Shankilab, official band union, the official charity product in a right to play. No, official PR partner, clerical communications, no, newspaper partner in it, straight down in media partner. Supporting Association of Australia Chamber, ကျင်းပါပေးသွားမှာဖြစ်ပါတယ်ကျွန်တော်တို့ ဒီကာလာဒင်နာနာကကျွန်တော်တို့ဒီရီယက်စိတ်အင်ဒက်စတရီတစ်ခုလုံးတစ်ဆက်လီဗရေးလုပ်တဲ့အာဒီအာညမ